Um, good morning to workshop 15, QI Science to Evolve, the CF Model of Care. My co-moderator and I are thrilled to see so many of you here this morning. We know there are very uh, great sessions going on at the same time, so we appreciate you being here. And we have some fantastic presenters, so we are excited to share them with you. I will kick us off with my disclosure. The only relationship I have to disclose is that I do receive consulting support for my role with the CF Learning Network from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Lineman, and I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and the CF Care Center Director at Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. I do receive grant support from CFF, NIH, and Vertex, as well as some consulting support from Vertex unrelated to this presentation. So in our CF community, quality improvement methods have played a key role in accelerating innovation in essential clinical care processes and outcomes. That being said, CF care is evolving in the context of increasing CFTR modulator use, and that has led to novel challenges for care delivery. So today's workshop will share multidisciplinary quality initiatives that test and implement ideas for new delivery of CF care. And our presentations today range from early infant diagnosis all the way to advanced lung disease, and they highlight novel challenges of the modulator era. Our learning objectives for today are to describe the use of quality improvement methods to test and implement innovative approaches to CF care, to identify opportunities to evolve CF care in the context of increasing modulator use, and to illustrate the use of shared learning structures to facilitate rapid and continuous improvement. So our format today, as are, is with all of the other workshops is that we will have five speaker groups today, 15-minute presentations. We'll have eight minutes of discussion and Q&A. And you are probably familiar by now that there is an app for NACFC. And through that app, you can submit discussion or questions. So we do encourage you to utilize the app for questions today. We'll be facilitating those after our speakers. We're in a small enough room, and I think we all like each other enough that if you are comfortable and you would like to stand and shout, you may do that. You can also come up and use this uh, microphone at the top, and then we'll make sure to repeat the questions so that the audience can hear if there is someone who's a little bit more quiet of a speaker. So I'm going to flip to this slide here. We will be doing introductions for all of our speakers today, but just so that you can see the depth of the learning that you're going to experience this morning. And it is my pleasure to introduce a dynamic duo from the Minnesota team. Uh, first up, we have uh, Ms. Kayla Hubley. And Kayla is a registered nurse care coordinator at the University of Minnesota Adult Cystic Fibrosis Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, presenting with her today is Kristen Jesse, who is a registered nurse care coordinator for the University of Minnesota Adult Cystic Fibrosis Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So please welcome Kristen and Kayla. Thank you for that welcome. We will be presenting our most recent QI project, Improving Mycobacterial Sputum Culture Collection in the Adult Patient During the Highly Effective Modulator Therapy Era. Like Anna said, my name is Kristen Jesse, and this is my colleague Kayla Hubley, and we're here from U of M, and we have no relationships to disclose for this presentation. After a review of our CF Center patient registry report, we noticed an ongoing decline in collection of Mycobacterium sputum cultures. This is problematic as we know early identification of non-tuberculosis Mycobacterium is essential for optimal treatment and management. <laughs> for purposes of this project, eligibility is defined as adult CF patients producing at least one mil of sputum with no mycobacterium sputum culture in the past 12 months. This project takes place during the initiation of highly effective modulator therapy and a global pandemic. Our project population includes in-person visits only, 
excluding new patients and virtual visits. For purposes of this presentation, you may hear us use the term AFB in place of Mycobacterium sputum culture, as this is both easier to say and acid fast bacilli, or AFB, is the name of the test we order and how we refer to this test at our center. For reference, we see approximately 450 adult CF patients at our center. We have seven CF providers and we have clinic five days a week. Our project aims include develop a process for AFB collection prioritization to improve completion rates, advance the understanding of AFB collection process in all departments and disciplines involved, promote standardization and consistency with both identification of eligibility and AFB collection documentation using our electronic health record. And finally, to increase AFB collection among eligible patients from 52.7 to 65% in 12 months. Process mapping. The first thing we did was gather our key stakeholders, which included a medical assistant, providers, nurses, social work, respiratory therapists, lab, and our patient partners. Then we physically mapped out our current process and identified barriers, questions, and ideas. This helped us determine the knowns and unknowns of our current process. Some of our key discoveries. Redundant work being done. Our providers were placing an order for a sputum culture for the next visit three months out. However, our CMAs needed to place the order again in the actual visit encounter. Amount of sputum needed. We were all under the impression five mils were needed for an AFB test. While we learned five mils is optimal, only one mil is needed to run the actual test. Our patients reported no longer producing sputum after initiation of HEMT. We generated questions. While a throat swab is not acceptable for an AFB, what if we did one for our CF culture? This inspired future changes. We realized our patients were not getting a sputum or a specimen cup in the PFT lab as previously practiced due to many different reasons. Staff, supply, reporting no sputum. And our CMAs were unaware of when an AFB was needed. The image you're seeing is our annotated run chart for our project. This is an overview of the interventions we have tested along the way, utilizing the model for improvement, PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act Cycles. The orange, the orange bar is our goal of 65%, each dot represents percentage of AFBs completed for every five eligible patients. In the coming slides, we'll break it down further. In September 2021, all of our CF providers met. The decision was made to prioritize first sputum specimen for AFB if they haven't had one in the last 12 months. Subsequent sputum sent for CF culture. During our process mapping, we discovered our CMAs were unsure of when to collect an AFB. As a result, we developed and impl implemented a CMA decision tree to provide clear direction and instruction for AFB collection. During this initial trial period of November 22nd to December 20th, 2021, we also created a paper tracking tool to track all of our patients manually. This tool is completed by the CMAs in clinic and included patient information, estimated amount of sputum, orders placed, and comments. On the left side, you can see the chart reflecting the trial period. Below, you'll find our CMA decision tree. The flow chart guides the CMA based on amount of sputum and last AFB to then what order to place. While the paper tracking tool was helpful, it was not sustainable. We knew we wanted to implement a process utilizing our electronic health record. At our center, we use EPIC as our EHR. For those of you not familiar with EPIC, it has a note function associated with each appointment where a brief note can be written. For our next intervention, we had our CMAs utilize this EPIC appointment note. We started small with one CMA going through one clinic day, scrubbing the schedule to identify patients that had not had an AFB completed in 12 or more months and writing in the appointment note, AFB due, to trigger the CMAs to order an AFB if the patient produced sputum. 
Then we expanded the use of this to a two-week trial where all three CMAs were involved scrubbing the schedule and identifying those patients due for an AFB. The outcome of this two-week trial, as you can see in the area circled on the right, is that it was initially beneficial in improving the AFB completion rate. However, it was not sustainable. It was burdensome and time-consuming. One of the CMAs ended up doing the majority of the work scrubbing the schedules because she was typically the first one to arrive to clinic. And when she wasn't there, it sometimes got missed. This led us to our next intervention. Keeping in mind we wanted to implement a change within our EHR, we also thought it'd be a good idea to work off of and modify an already pre-existing process. Our CMAs use a dot phrase for every patient that they room in clinic. For those of you not familiar with the dot phrase, it's a shortcut within EPIC that enters whatever text is associated with a period followed by a phrase, dot phrase. Their original dot phrase simply stated, medications were reviewed and vital signs taken. We modified this to include the information we previously collected on the initial paper tracking tool. You can see a screenshot of it on the right of the screen. Uh, we included specimen collection type, orders placed, and we built it to have it auto-populate the date of the last AFB the patient has on file. We were hopeful that implementing this dot phrase would help us improve the AFB collection rate, but as you can see in the area on the circled on the right, it did not have the anticipated success. On June 8th, 2022, I met with all three CMAs to discuss these results. From the chart on the left, you can see we're still under our goal. During the meeting, two of the CMAs expressed confusion on where to identify the date of the last AFB. Our dot phrase blows in all the results and dates of AFB performed for each patient. We provided re-education, and our CMAs also provided feedback and suggestions for dot phrase improvement. So after re-education, as you can see, things start to kind of taper down um, and decline, but then they start to come back up. Then we implemented the CMA recommendations to develop dot phrase version two, looking at the dot phrase and changes. Everything is the same except for under specimen collection type. We added in patient left without specimen, less than one mil of sputum, mostly spit options. And under orders placed, we added option for provider requested AFB. Not only is this dot phrase useful for tracking data, but it's been transformed to become a communication tool as well. Our next step was to finally meet with lab. Early on, we created a Pareto chart that identified our barriers. And a large barrier to completing AFBs was having samples be canceled by lab. We needed to meet with lab to discuss this barrier and to make sure everyone was on the same page. Unfortunately, since there were many people that needed to be involved with varying schedules, vacations, and COVID, it took many months to get this meeting scheduled. The meeting included one of our CF providers, Kayla and I as the registered nurses, one of our medical assistants, clinic lab staff, as well as microbiology lab leadership. During this meeting, we shared our process and our project aims with lab, and we reviewed their current process. We learned that at the time of the meeting, the lab's current process was to collect the CF culture first before sending off the AFB sputum, when they both were sent in one sputum cup. And oftentimes, there won't be enough sputum left to successfully run the AFB. We shared with lab that our providers had met and come to an agreement to prioritize the AFB to ensure we were able to collect this for eligible patients. There were two new processes that were outcomes from this meeting. First, our CMAs now add a comment to the CF order stating prioritize AFB when both CF and AFB cultures were sent in the same sputum cup during one encounter. Then lab's new process was to review the CF orders looking for that prioritize AFB comment, and they would first aliquot the AFB prior to running the CF sputum. Right after the meeting with the lab, Kayla and I began providing feedback to our CMAs in the form of a weekly newsletter. Every Monday, we would review the week prior to closely monitor adherence to our new processes, both the utilization of the dot phrase and placing that order comment, prioritize AFB. We provided this weekly feedback for about two months. 
We use this weekly newsletter to celebrate successes as well as explore areas that required continued improvement. We felt like the close feedback helped keep momentum and keep the process changes at the forefront of everyone's mind. This was beneficial in the short term, however not sustainable for the long term. An outcome of our weekly newsletter emails was identifying multiple, multiple missing order comments for lab. This is a new process and additional work for our CMAs. So we added in this pink help text as a visual reminder. This is our final version and what is currently being utilized. So some key takeaways. We learned the importance of communication and teamwork. Our process involves many different team members and different departments. It's important to have everyone at the decision-making table and make sure everyone understands each other's roles. The benefit of adapting an already existing process and not reinventing the wheel. Adapting a process with, within an existing workflow is much easier than creating everything new. Uh, feelings and data are different. With over 831 specimens collected, 39% were sputum cultures. This is much more than what we were expecting. Establishing a process for data collection and reporting is important to keep up with data, allowing time to observe the process, as well as intervening and addressing any issues as needed. This was achieved through our weekly report outs and our weekly um, CMA newsletters to provide additional support and monitoring of the process. Take time to celebrate what's going well and all the hard work as a team. We identified five new cases of NTM as a result of this project. And one of our unexpected outcomes, our CMAs felt a lot of pressure to collect AFBs with the rollout of this project. As a result, they began sending AFBs on everyone, even if they weren't technically eligible. And this is very costly. So part of our weekly emails includes tracking and following up on any unnecessary AFB and feedback. This has been effective and helpful to have a planned communication time. So now what? We're going to continue our data collection, assess for reliability, and we hope to continue our work and possibly publish in the future. Now, any questions or comments? <laughs> Just fantastic use of quality improvement. If you know QI, you know that they've used so many of the tools and uh, data, fantastic use of data. I was writing down so many comments and I know what the presentation is already. So uh, first question that we have is that this improvement included your team CMAs, which is a role that I'm curious to know if they are typically part of your QI team and if they're not, because they're likely in clinic doing a lot of the day-to-day -day, uh, work as everyone else is, how did you help them engage in improvement knowing that a lot of the changes would be on their shoulders? Great question. Um, I can start <laughs> yeah, with this. Yeah. Um, so our CMAs are not uh, like a standard role that's typically on our QI. Um, groups, um, just because they're uh, CMAs across all of pulmonology and everything like that, just not not just with our CF team. Um, I, th the majority, as we talked about, of this process really fell on the shoulders of the CMAs. They're really leading it. They had amazing feedback, and they. I think a lot of it was internal. They were very engaged. Once we did some education with them about the importance, like what an AFB is, the importance and why um, why we're um, rolling out this initiative, they were very engaged and very excited to make a difference because they care about their patients too. Um, and so it was very collaborative. And I, I think that once we started sh sharing some of the data with them, they got really excited. Um, even with those weekly communication that we had with them, a lot of positive feedback that we're acknowledging as a team, their role and how crucial they are and that they're making a direct dif difference in the, the lives of their patients. So I think that um, they were just very engaged um, from the start, and we really relied a lot on them to understand the process because they're they're the ones that are carrying this out. So they're really kind of the experts um, in the workflow itself. And as they're they're not typically a part of our QI team, but for this. Specific
specific project, we did include like one of the main CMAs um, at a lot of the meetings. She was there for the meeting with the lab, um, there for process mapping, learning her like role in the AFB collection. Um, and she attended, I mean, a few of our meetings as well, just to have her input and, and did a lot of, uh, Kayla did a lot of education with them as well in clinic. That's a fantastic example of engaging stakeholders so that the work is with them and not just to them or for them. So love that. So our next question is from Will Sudemeyer. Did you consider using Port CF or an EPIC report to identify and track data on patients needing AFB cultures? And if not, how did you collect data, both I think who was due for it on the front end, um, but also on the back end who received it? So we did not use Port CF or Smart Reports, but that is an option, definitely. Um, we just, so building the dot phrase, it blew in the date of the last AFB in EPIC in our electronic health record. Um, so we thought that would be a very, like it's coming right from the source, right from our electronic health record. Um, so it would be accurate. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the right? Um, on the, like, tracking after the fact to make sure that those who were due yeah. um, received. Yep. So, so there was a period of time that we were staying up to speed with like collecting data and then there was a period of time that we lapsed collect collecting data. So Kayla and I went back and manually looked in every patient's chart over the co course of months and then until we caught up knowing that we realized that we really needed to stay up to date with um, tracking the data real time. So then, then it became a weekly process of us just going in and reviewing patient charts. Yeah, and just to add one of the kind of benefits, so prior to us doing this dot phrase, um, the CMAs, so when we originally came out with that decision tree, they would go in and, um, as KJ had mentioned, um, scrub the schedules and look back in their chart and sort through and see when was their, their date of their last AFB. That's hard because it takes a lot of time at the beginning of a shift, um, as well as there can be just human error um, with that. So having that dot phrase um, shoot in that the their last AFBs and we can see if it's their first one or if it's their third one and whatnot um, gives access to everyone um, versus sometimes with like Port CF and things like that. Those are great ways to you know generate these reports and we'll definitely um, look into and utilizing that uh, moving forward since it's very manual and time consuming to go through each chart, but everyone has access to that dot phrase. So it's really nice to just put it in there and have a lot of that clarity um, for each individual patient as they're coming in. A lot of great questions in the, in the app. Um, one that just came in from John Roberts, when you prioritized AFB via the lab, did you see any QNS on your regular cultures that followed? No, we didn't. They were still able to collect it. And what our lab made it seem like is they would pull the uh, one mil of sputum for the AFB, and then if there was not enough sputum really left, like really aliquot for the CF culture, they couldn't swab the container mm -hmm. because we know that we can do throat swabs. So they were still able to get enough sputum to run the CF culture as well. Great, that's a great point. Um, Mike Powers wanted to know how often was this project reviewed and discussed by the whole QI team, or did this fall on the RNs to help direct? So we have weekly QI um, meetings as a team. So it's one of our topics that we that we on our agenda that we're tracking um, and reporting out on. And then we were able to keep up with the data weekly because on Mondays we would sit down in our office and we would um, review the previous week and we'd send that CMA. Um, newsletter, that email. So that was like a built-in process to keep us, you know, committed and um, making sure that we had information to report out then on that Wednesday meeting. So that's, it kind of worked out that we would um, have a few days um, to have all that data so that we could report out on. So consistently keeping up with that and that's something that we found very helpful. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the presentation and for the questions and answers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So our next speaker is Shinan Pai. Um, she is the program coordinator, a respiratory therapist, and the QI coordinator at Dell Children's Medical Center.
Hello, everyone. We're on day two. Thank you. And so good to see so many of you guys I didn't see yesterday in person. This is wonderful. It's like a family reunion on my QI family here. <laughs> um, I would like to say that, hang on. I have uh, no disclosure related to this. And to begin, quality improvement, like all quality improvement initiative, it tells a story. And I want to tell you a little story about uh, the journey that our team, team take. And with every good story, there's a little bit of drama. What else makes it good if it didn't have a little conflict? So we're going to do a quality improvement on quarterly visit. And so sometimes for our families coming into these quality improvement uh, quarterly visits, um, they get a little distracted, whether it be graduation, I can't come, so-and-so has to be somewhere, or I got to go visit grandma, and she's in Virginia, and I'm in Texas, and, you know, we just can't make the, the flight, or they're lost and confused because they're first-time moms, and they're first-time babies, and they're not sure, and we're just drinking from a fire hose, and what's going on? Or they're doing super well because they're on Trikafta, and you're like, you know, maybe we don't need to go right now because I feel great. So these are kind of the things that we're talking about as um, we discuss this. And with all good stories, we have a little background, a little history and intro. So for our center, when we reviewed our um, registry data to see if they were coming four times a year, and back before the pandemic, um, it was at 72.9%, um, while the average for um, all the centers here, top 10, was at 80. Well, um, I'm a little competitive, and so is our director, uh, if you guys know. So we're like, wait, why can't we aim for 80%? Because we want to be an A student. So um, we started looking at this, well, bam, the pandemic. Hit. That was probably the climax of our story, where everything was just tossed in the air. It's like, you know, the tornado hit, the cyclone hit, bombs are going off in the background of the movie. Um, and we're like, well, what do we do at this point? Um, so we try to decide innovative ways on our story to come up with a solution. So our aim statement for us was that we want to see if we could, with close monitoring, we go with baby steps, small bites, and get to 78% you know, of a five improvement goal. And then maybe we'll just climb a little bit because we didn't want to bite off too much because we want to celebrate the little things. So we um, set our cohort, and here's our patient population for our center, and we just wanted to focus on the last four years because it was the pre-pandemic, during pandemic, a hosh posh of a hybrid of pandemic and whatever we got going on right now. So it was a very good var variety. So of course, you know, quality improvement means you have to track data. There's a lot on this slide, but I will go later with pictures because we all like picture books. So um, we'll go through each one one by one about our spreadsheet and how we tracked it, who was involved, and how do we use these tools in our patient reviews. And then I'll also talk about the journey with our PDSA cycles. So PDSA cycle one, which is back in 2019, we decided that we want to send out these certified letters um, every six months if, you know, hey, it's been six months, we haven't seen you, I know you've like rescheduled like twice and we still need to come see you. <laughs> and um, we, of course, we also have the one that's one year mark, those lost to tracking, like, okay, not sure if you guys moved, but you know, if you have, Hope you guys have established with another center, but if you haven't, let's, let's hopefully we can revisit. Is it because we don't have the right phone number? What's going on? With PDSA 2, that was a big turn because telehealth came into the, you know, throw. Well, like, well, well, maybe with telehealth we could get more because it's easy, you know? We have, Texas is kind of big. Um, you know, you drive 12 hours, you're still in Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you cross six different states, <laughs> you know? And some of our family live in what I call middle nowhere, Texas. It's like a combination of desert and I don't know what else is there. I don't really go there, but it's a long drive and you might not get Wi-Fi. It's a great place to be disengaged, but it also means they can't engage with us. So we have that. And then, of course, we always have people like me who's IT challenge and I mean, I'm dropping calls left and right, so, you know, we got to work on that. 
And then, so here's an example of our letter for our six months, um, as well as our one year. I know it's tiny, but you can always contact me and we can submit that or something, or you can just use a magnifying glass. Um, but it's templated where it's easy for either myself, the nurse, or our MA, or anybody to do this, where that's they can just change the certain subtlety of what we need to do. And it's agreed upon by our whole entire center. So we want the patients to see that the whole team's on with all the director, all the physician, all the associate director and um, coordinator is signing this letter because we are on the same path and want the same goal and want the same best care for everybody. Um, and again, there's multiple different versions if it's a six months version or one year version. And uh, with a good story, and we want to talk about how we got to that journey, right? It's the path of getting there and how we get there. And sometimes we take a little left turn when we should take a right. So here is our process map of how we go from where we are now and people that's not seen in six months to maybe we can bring them back. Um, of course, there's always decisions to make in the path, whether, you know, not everybody wants to go the same route. So we wanted to uh, talk about that. And again, we will go through this a little bit later in later slides. But this is how we track them, whether they're coming um, routinely every six months or a year or, you know, what's going on. So now that you guys have seen our, you know, PDSA 1 and 2, we want to go with three. Um, three came about uh, because of all the modulators that has come about and people are like, I don't want to come because I feel so good. So we decided to do a partnership of an agreement form where we talk and partner with our families and we discuss the importance of the modulators and we sign an agreement form so that there's actually three parties on these signatures. There is the parent, and then there's the leadership, and then there's a witness. And then we want to make sure that we're all accountable. And we've had a situation where we had to pull up the agreement as a friendly reminder of these are the ground rules we set in the very beginning that we agreed upon. Let's review them together. And so that we can continue to give you guys and your child the best care um, so that we can go. It's like you still go see the dentist, even though if you don't have a cavity, and get your teeth cleaned, right? We don't just not brush our teeth, right? We just have leather teeth. And, and sometimes it's good to get us all done. But, you know, it just it is what it is. So, and then, of course, PDSA 4 is pending, because that's what's happening right now. And we can't just, you know, maybe I'll give you a trailer later, a teaser on what we're going to do. Um, for a sequel. So this is a letter of our modulator agreement. It's a front and back form. We didn't want to do a book, right? This is just a very simple, the front gives you a background of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and the importance of doing it. And the back is where we do the initial of all the parties of why it's important and that we are setting the grounds ground rule and we're accountable for each other, not just from the care team, but as well as the family. It's, it's what co-production is, right? This is all about partnership. There's two sides to a coin. It's not just one side. And we want to make sure we're all on the same page. So, and just, this is my disclosure. All this is not for realsies. There's no patient identifier, but I had to use this as an example. Um, instead of patient name, we I just wrote consented patients, which are in the yellow, and then I wrote um, you know unconsented versus transition patient or inactive patient, just to tell you. And I kind of did a, like a range of birthdays, so you kind of can see the different populations that we can have. And I just wrote in different types of appointments, so you kind of kind of see. So what's really cool about this spreadsheet, which I didn't create, our um, very cool research data coordinator of our team, who is very, very savvy on Excel, helped me with this. Um, and we decided to make this interactive. So first things first, let's go with the names. It is highlighted so that we can see who is consented, who's unconsented. And maybe we need to talk to unconsented people to get them consented if we're going to be doing this. 
in addition. And then, um, and who has met the Cordy Lou visit and who's inactive, maybe lost to, um, you know, wherever there be and follow up with them if need be. We also have a date key where um, if they're here for a face-to-face -face clinic, they're in just regular print. Um, but if they're telehealth, we get it in blue. And we have it in red if, um, for whatever reason, they're not meeting quarterly visit because they don't have the traditional mutations. And they have that, you know, gray line. Is it CFRMS? Is it something? Which our physician always look at the guidelines to make sure, OK, are they OK coming twice a year? You know, what's going on? So those are denoted in red. And also, all these are um, have little formulas in the Excel spreadsheet so that the program automatically updates um, the date of birth, their age, and the last appointment as long as you put, put that in there. So it's pre-populated, no math, which is great. So part two of this slide, because I couldn't fit it all in one, is the fact that we have the number of days in keys. And these change color, again, because there's a program that we put in the slot. So as long as you put their last clinic date on there, it changes the color, and you can query it and sort it <laughs> when we do patient review. So the green ones means um, there are 30 days before their quarterly visit is due. We send reminders. Hello, you're coming up. Make sure everything's good. If you have vacation or soccer game or whatever's going on, maybe this is a good time to reschedule so you can come. Um, if it's yellow, you're within the range of the quarterly visit, just mean to make sure. Um, if they're yellow with a little red text, means uh, they're like one to two months past quarterly due, and maybe it's another reminder for us to check in, like, hey, what happened? Um, and if it turns pink, means, okay, we might want to think about sending that six-month letter. Let's call again so that before we, like, give them this certified letter, it's, you know, not going to, it's a little official that way, right? And then if they're pink and red, it's like, whoa, stop sign, you know, we're coming up on one year, like, are we losing this person to, you know, lost a follow-up or what's going on? And then we also have these little notes in the sections where like, okay, was the letter sent? Was there any additional note? I mean, did we sign this agreement form? And then we also track the modulator agreement form in a different spreadsheet that's kind of connected. Again, it's an IT savvy thing that I'm so glad my team has strength to help me with this um, so that it, it's all in, you know, how spreadsheet has little different tabs in the bottom. It's in another tab. Um, but it is great. We use it for our um, um, patient review meetings. We use it in our QI meetings. We use it in our transition meetings. Um, it, because you can sort and query depending on what you need. Um, and it's super helpful. It's all one sheet. So like every story, there's a number, and every number has story. This is my data part of my story piece. Um, so as you can see that the study was, you know, done in 2018. We've been doing these yearly PDSA. I know some PDSA can be as fast as every week or every month, but for this one, we want to make sure we did it yearly because we want to see it also in our registry. Um, and Yay, this year we, exed, uh, we exceeded our goals by 1.6. Now, we can't say it's significant because our population size is a little small, but we like to, again, celebrate the small wins. It's an increase, right? And it's hard to get any kind of increase in these days. So we're going to be pretty excited to celebrate that. Um, and here is, um, uh, for those people who like pictures, our graph. And the pink is what we're projecting if everybody shows up this year at the last quarter. <laughs> now, I, I think with the holidays, it might be like, eh, but we like to think very positive. So the blue is what's been happening, and then the pink is the projected. So if you like it, uh, glass half full, you're on the left, glass half empty, you're on the right, but it's basically the same data. It depends on how you want to see it, you know. Um, and then... Again, this is the direction you want the graph to go. Um, so in conclusion, I think we've had good metrics. We surpassed our goal. It's a success. Everything is going to be standardized from here on forth. 
Um, and then we're going to look into making a sequel for our next story, um, which is looking at protocols. And right now we're at 79.9. .9. We still have three more months to go to hit our goal. So good thing there. And then in our parking lot for the year after, we're going to look at no-show rates. Yeah, and then here's my contact information and um, questions coming up. Hope you like my story. See you. <laughs> or maybe it's to be continued. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shinan. This is certainly a challenge that many of our sites, both adult and pediatric, are facing in the modulator era. We have a couple questions coming in. Um, I wanted to start with, how did families respond to the highly effective modulator therapy agreement? Were there any negative responses? And if so, how did you address those? So we have a little uh, trick. Because usually when something gets approved, on the day of approval, we have usually a phone bank boom. <laughs> and, uh, and our poor nurses get did you just hear it got approved for this age? We would like to have it now, like times 10 calls on one hour. And you want to capture that when they're really excited. So we're like, OK, well, we are excited for you too. Let's talk about how we can you know, get this medicine for you. But before we get that, let's set some ground rules. And they're usually super excited. And they would love to sign your agreement form. You know, it's not like it's a prenup. I mean, you know, they're like, yeah, let's sign this. Let's get this medicine. So um, that's always a great time to do it. Um, but for the ones that were before the agreement form came up, we were just like, you know what? Because more are coming. You know, I know you guys got the Kaleidico, but, you know, with Trikafta, whatever, we, we want to make sure we're still on the same path. And your kid might even be more eligible for something that's coming down the pipeline that we're not aware of. Let's just make sure that we're still going the right direction, same direction, at the same pace. I don't know if that answered your question, but... Yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Shinian. Um, kind of a follow-up question. So you shared that this was about collaboration with patients and families. So obviously, you know, coming up with something like an agreement and making sure that you have language that's reflective of the care team's responsibilities as well to, to caring for the child. And we want the best for you, as you reflected. Um, how did you or did you use your patient and family partners or others in kind of the development of the letter to make sure that the language was approachable rather than kind of, um, you know, you don't want to reflect that you're, you're, you're doing a gotcha game in that regard. Um, could you tell us a little bit for more about sure, that? For sure, for sure. We do, and, and I'm just going to make this an honest, we do have one in the audience. But anyway, so I have to make sure I answer this properly. We always look for our family, and we always want to make sure we show up to a parent or even our older teenagers mm -hmm. because we want to promote um, that transition self-care. And it's a good one to have for them to see. Um, and we like to give it to a variety individually just so that they can review at their own pace. Um, at the time that we were doing it, especially with the PDSA 2 with the telehealth, we had um, a parent that was doing a QI with us on telehealth. They were our guinea pig pilot. So we went over that with her. And she was like, okay, this is good, this is good. And she actually was super helpful and shared it with her children. And it was it was almost like a family, you know, over the dinner table kind of conversation with us. Um, and that they're the one that told us they only wanted one page. Because we originally had multiple, because, you know, all about the module, you could just go on and on about that, right? But it was them that really um, thought, we just, we don't want too much. Just one sheet of paper. That's it. So I don't know if that helped. That's great. Um, I think there's a few questions sort of focusing on the patients who were lost to follow up. Mm -hmm. And um, what, how did they respond when you reached out to them, either via letters or going over the agreement? Or, you know, were there patients that, you know, just said we're really healthy and, you know, we only want to come twice a year? So I'm going to give a little um, shout out to the PEP team here because we had to use a lot of our PEP skills on these calls um, because you really have to, you know, get that trust 
and use a lot of open-ended questions. Um, and from those questions, we actually now have more QI stories in our parking lot <laughs> um, than we really want to admit to, but it's good, right? Because it tells you there's holes. So for example, one of them would be cost. Um, our facility is connected to the hospital. So we also have a facility cost. That is not if you went to a private office. And if you have multiple children, that cost adds up. And with the cost of living in Austin, Texas, which we apparently we want to be the next Silicon Valley, our cost of living just shot up by an ungodly amount of percentage where like we can't even afford our house if we sold it. You know, kind of crazy. And there's food insecurity, there's all that stuff that comes up. And they have to choose, do I, if, if we're on the modulator, we're really well, do we really want to come in because it's so expensive? And we'd rather use that money to do refills or buy food that's good for our children. And so those open up a lot more questions, but that also allows the team to engage and even have other team members come in and, and we'd work with them and partner with them to see what we can do. Thank you. That was actually my next question um, about the barriers that you may have uncovered because there are lots of very valid reasons why people are either not able to or, or might not want to come to clinic. Um, so when you talk about those barriers, like you said, you had some ideas for QI projects. Um, were you also able to hear more from the patients and families from that co-production perspective about potential uh, maybe adjustments to the quarterly visits or, or were you more so going by the guidelines to say this is, this is what we need with labs, this is what we need with pulmonary function monitoring, those types of things? Of course, there's always the must-haves, right? Because, you know, um, our physician always wants the PFTs, always wants the sputum cultures, you know. There's some, so that's where the home spirometer comes in. And I have to thank the CF Foundation for providing that because that is something our um, team use, especially our, I know for our adult side, is a very big one. Um, you don't want them to have to drive in, you know, 12 hours just to come see us. Um, so there's that. And then two, oh, sorry. Can I just pause a second? <laughs> um, two is that um, we understand there's challenges. And we, you're not, we're not there to be, you know, the tiger mom, like, hey, you got to do this or else kind of thing. We, we want to make sure we partner and be understanding and give each other grace. And that's grace not just to the children, to the parent, but also to the caregivers. We have, I mean, and that's something we all learned the last three years is grace, right? So if you, you just do your best, if this is the best, then we're going to be okay. And if you keep that communication open and you keep that trust open, then we're okay, you know? And yes, we like to be the top 10% and everything, but... Do we really need to? No, because it's, I, it's the same story a mother would tell a child. You don't have to be top 10% of your high school, right? If you're doing your best and you're top 25%, I still love you just as much. <laughs> and, you know, just don't go wreck the car and some party at 2 a.m. in the morning. We're good because then a different mom is going to come up, and that's a different way you don't want to see. And it goes with our families too, right? We, we love them just the same. Everyone's going to be different. They're going to have a different situation. And as long as that trust is open, I think we're good. Beautifully said. Thank you, Cheyenne. Thanks. Thank you so much to Cheyenne and her team for their hard work. Thanks. All right. Two wonderful presentations and a few more to go. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kimberly Trishman, who is an assistant professor and pediatric gastroenterologist at Dornbecker Children's Hospital, Oregon Health and Science University. So we are pleased to have her here today.
Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for having me here today. I have no disclosures. Over the next 15 minutes, I hope to show you all how powerful QI methods can be in innovating CF care, specifically in coordinating and streamlining CFGI care, and how using standard learning structures can facilitate rapid and continuous improvement. So why focus specifically on CFGI care coordination? In August 2020, I started at OHSU and took over CFGI care as the previous CF gastroenterologist left OHSU right as I started. The change in CFGI providers left a backlog of new referrals as well as a need to transition all the existing CF patients needing GI care to myself. It also became very apparent when I started that there was a lot of confusion amongst patients, providers, and scheduling staff regarding the scheduling process leading to all parties involved feeling quite frustrated. It became evident that we needed to do something to improve this process, both for our patients and for ourselves. The first step toward doing something was getting me up to speed with QI processes, frameworks, and techniques. With the mentoring of Dr. Powers, access to the CF Learning Network QI training, as well as completing a series of courses on quality improvement through the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI, I was able to learn about the Model for Improvement, or MFI. The MFI is a framework to guide improvement work, and it is a simple yet powerful tool for accelerating improvement. It helps us take our ideas and turn them into action. It does this by forcing you to answer three key questions and use a framework to plan, test, and evaluate your ideas for improving processes and outcomes. For me, this slide here served as a roadmap that kept me on track. It pulls the three questions from the previous slide and arranges the process of improvement into linear steps to move us forward. I think answering the questions, what are we trying to accomplish, how will we know that a change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will re result in improvement is a very important first step. In the past, when starting a QI project, I found it can be very easy to get lost along the way. You are so excited to tackle the problem that you just jump in. And the tendency is to jump straight to trying to make changes without first fully understanding the problem and making a plan to improve you ultimately end up somewhere you had no intent of going, and you encounter unexpected adverse results, or your project hits a roadblock, stalls, and is abandoned. Using this framework forces you to have a robust planning at the beginning to define the scope and current breakdown of the problem, define measures and set goals, develop a theory for improvement, and finally design, test, and study changes leading to the sustained improvement you were looking for. Now, I just mentioned that this slide served as a roadmap for me. I also say that when I first saw this slide, I really had an aha moment. I had previous exposure to QI concepts in the past throughout my medical education and was a bit overwhelmed by the variety of forms and tools available. Project charters, global aims, smart aims, SFMEA, KDDs, fishbones, five Ys, PDSAs, mm -hmm. alphabet soup. <laughs> What do I use for what and when? This was the slide that pulled it all together in one place for me. Lining up the tools below the steps like this is really what made the process clear to me. So throughout the rest of this talk, we will be referencing this as our roadmap, and I'll highlight the tools we used along the way. So after getting acquainted with QI frameworks in January of 2021, my team and I formally agreed to start the CFGI scheduling QI project. We began with answering question one, what are we trying to accomplish? The tool we used to answer this question was to develop a project charter and global aim. This project charter, or the project charter helps us set the stage for the project, and one of the most important aspects is developing the global aim, which states our overall outcome and grounds us to a purpose. This is different than a SMART aim, which we'll talk more about later. But as a preview of what's to come, SMART aims are specific and allow us to achieve our global aim while our global aim communicates our goals. This is our project charter, and I don't expect you to read this at all. There are many templates and examples out there to use, and they all have the same basic information. They describe the project, the background, the scope, the timeline, the roles and responsibilities, and the global aim. And here you can see that our global aim was to improve the scheduling coordination process for CFGI patients to optimize coordinated patient care and reduce travel and time burdens on people with cystic fibrosis. 
Sitting down as a team to complete this charter was essential in bringing our team together with a shared understanding of the problem, the goals, and the process to reach those goals. Once we've developed the project charter, we quickly realized that we needed to do more work to understand the current process and outcomes before we could go forward with identifying interventions and further inform our more specific goals and aims. The next tool we turned toward was process mapping. Process mapping is incredibly helpful in allowing you to identify problem areas and opportunities for improvement. Process mapping allowed us to identify our current state of systems and have a shared understanding as a team of what was happening. It allowed us to improve um, to compare and contrast our actual process versus ideal flow and identify areas of opportunity to improve. It also provided documentation of where we were and where we eventually wanted to be. So this is another busy slide that I don't expect you to be able to read, um, and you can go see it at our poster number 68 if you'd like, but this is our master process map for getting a CF patient scheduled for a coordinated CFGI appointment. As you can see, it is complicated and convoluted. It has multiple termination points that end in a patient not being scheduled and lost to follow up. But once we mapped all this out, we were able to identify redundancies, bottlenecks, and areas to target to improve. And something that I want to point out to you here to save for a couple of slides from now is that we identified some main starting points in the map that drove the processes, and those were centered around whether the patient was a new patient, whether they were seen by me alone, or whether they were seen by the POEM team virtually or face-to-face. -face. So once we completed our process mapping and had a thorough understanding of our current process, the next step was to set specific goals and define the measures we would use to show that we've reached our goal. We did this by developing SMART aims. If you recall, global aims are more general and ground us to a purpose, while SMART aims allow us to achieve our global aim. SMART aims are specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timely. We used this particular worksheet to develop our SMART aims. We chose first to focus on making sure we got coordinated follow-up CFGI appointments and that those follow appointments would be made at the time their current clinic visit of their current clinic visit. Simultaneously, while doing our process mapping, we had also begun collecting baseline data on how often we were getting coordinated CFGI appointments. We used that data to develop our SMART aim, which you see here. We ultimately came up with two SMART aims. The first was to increase the percent of CF patients who get coordinated CF and GI appointments from 77% to 90% by December 31st, 2021, and to increase the percent of CF patients getting their follow-up appointments scheduled at the time of current clinic visit from 58% to 90% by December 31st, 2021. So you can see here clearly that our SMART aims are different than our global aim, but that the SMART aims are the actions that will allow us to achieve our global aim, while our global aim communicated our objectives and overall vision. Okay, so at this point, we've identified a problem, assembled a team to address the problem, defined our global aim, achieved us understanding of our current process through process mapping, defined SMART aims, and measures to achieve our global aim. And now we needed to identify what interventions to implement to move our process of improvement forward. This is where we needed to develop a theory for improvement. And there are a variety of tools available to help guide and develop your theory for improvement. These include things like a key driver diagram, a simplified failure mode effect analysis, fishbone cause and effect diagrams, and the five whys. Essentially, all of these tools help you um, understand your current process to identify areas of improvement to target. We chose to use the Simplified Failure Mode Effects Analysis, or SFMEA, and a key driver diagram to help us identify interventions to implement. This is the Simplified Failure Mode Effect Analysis, the SFMEA, that we used. And yes, I know this is another busy slide, and I don't expect you to be able to read all the words, but rather, I want you to let me show you how we use this to identify possible interventions. We started completing this form by using our process mapping to fill in the middle current process boxes. This is where I want you to call where I pointed out on our detailed process map how there were four main pathways through the map. You see, the way the SFMEA works is you take the key pathways or main points in your process map and arrange them in the middle row. Then referencing our process map again, we pulled in our failure modes, the things that weren't working or causing inefficiencies, redundancies, or bottlenecks. You can see that within each process, sometimes the failure modes overlapped. This tool really helped us to see what wasn't working and it also provided us a way to start brainstorming interventions, which you put in at the top, and we completed this form together as a team. 
We then further refined our theory for improvement by using a key driver diagram, or the KDD. This is the particular KDD we used, and I really like this form because it brings back the global and smart aim so that we can visually see all at once the overall project and how our key drivers and interventions get us to our aims. We pulled in our global aims and smart aims, then synthesized the, what we put on our SFMEA to develop the key drivers here in the middle column. And logically, our next step was deciding on what interventions we thought would be most fruitful and entering them in the interventions column, linking them up with our key drivers. This really allowed us to identify interventions and be confident they would affect change. So now we have our theory for improvement, and we are ready to start testing our interventions in our Plan, Do, Study, Act, or PDSA cycle. We have spent this whole time in the planning stage. We stated our question, predicted our outcome, developed a plan to test change, and identified what data we needed to collect. Now we were finally ready to implement our changes, study their results, and then decide whether to adapt, adopt, or abandon our interventions. And here's the final form we used, the PDSA worksheet. And again, I don't expect you to read all of this, but I just want to point out to you in this forum is the culmination of planning, all the planning work we did and serves as an overall snapshot of the project. You can see that it describes the interventions we are testing. Our interventions were to hire a full complement of PAS staff, educate PAS staff on new expectations, and have real-time communication between MD, RN, and PAS at the time of clinic visit regarding next follow-up. And PAS is the term that we use for our schedulers and stands for patient access specialist. The form then goes on to describe who it impacts, what the objective is, what the test is, what success will look like, what we predict will happen, how we will collect the data, who is responsible for what and by when, when the cycle was carried out as planned, what were the results, what did we learn, and will we adapt, adopt, or abandon? And spoiler alert, we adopted. Which brings us to step number seven, analyze data and adopt, adapt, or abandon interventions. The graph on the left is showing you the percent of time that a CF patient gets their follow-up coordinated CF appointment made before they leave their current clinic visit. The graph on the right is showing you the percent of the time that CF patients were getting the CF GI appointment coordinated overall. The time scale is different between the two graphs, so I've added the, to the graph on the left the months so you can more easily compare the two and see our improvements over time compared with the timing of our interventions. I also tried to shade the graphs with colors according to the MFIR and our timeline through the process of improvement. On the left graph, the starting center line here shows we weren't doing a great job of getting follow-up appointments scheduled before the patient left clinic, only doing that about 58% of the time. We were doing a little bit better with getting coordinated appointments overall at about 77% of the time. And our goal was 90% of the time. You can see a clear shift in the center line following our interventions, which I put up on the screen for you to remind you what they were. You can see a clear shift in the center line with an increase to about 96% for both overall coordination for getting a follow-up appointment at the meet of time current visit for overall coordination and getting at the time of current visit. And as you can see, we've been able to maintain this improvement. So that brings us to step number eight. Enjoy the fruits of your labor. We sent out a survey to our CFGI patients to ask them their thoughts about our efforts to coordinate CFGI care. And this is some of the feedback that we got. As you can see, the majority of patients expressed decreased time spent traveling to appointments, decreased time away from work or school, decreased burden on scheduling appointments, better understanding of CFGI conditions, and improved satisfaction with the care team. Additionally, nobody thought that there were no benefits to our coordination efforts. I'll also say that I personally feel much more satisfied with our coordination efforts and feel much less burden and have much increased joy in work. The same sentiments have been shared with me from multiple members of my team. So in conclusion, QI processes and frameworks such as the MFI are instrumental in guiding and accelerating improvement work. By utilizing QI tools for improvement, clinic coordination for CFGI patients was improved from 77% to 96%, exceeding our goals. The percent of CFGI patients who had their follow-up visit scheduled at current clinic visit was improved 58% to 96%, again, exceeding our goal. And all stakeholders experienced increased satisfaction and joy in work.
was just wonderful. Such a great overview of QI methodology and all the tools that we love to use. Um, I'm actually amazed by how even how good your baseline was, even with coordination. Um, I'm wondering how, with multiple pulmonologists you man who have their own schedules and are in their clinic in different days, how did you manage to coordinate so many visits? Would, were they still able to see their primary CF pulmonologist, or did they have to see a different provider to coordinate with your clinic day? So the way our, our, the CF clinic is run is, um, at least where I'm usually involved, is Tuesdays. There's some on Mondays, too. I have dedicated, um, in my template, dedicated spots for CF patients in my kind of otherwise general clinic that is on the same day as their overall like uh, multidisciplinary clinic where all the dietitian, social worker, pharmacy, everybody is there. Um, and as far as the pulmonologists, they kind of rotate through that clinic. So at times the patients at baseline will see a different pulmonologist. Thank you. Um, loved the data. And you mentioned about the sustained improvement, which is beautiful to see. Um, and I also really appreciated the use of the color blocks from your run charts to indicate your planning versus testing from the, the path of the project. Um, and so in that, and I don't know if you want to go back to the slide for this question, but you can see that the time is actually very quick between when you started um, and when you achieved your aim. Mm -hmm. So um, not too long. How did you get your team and your stakeholders on board for those planning phases, which I think sometimes, like you mentioned, you've done in the past, it's everyone's excited, enthusiastic. You want to jump into making changes. So it can be really hard for teams to slow down and move through those phases. Was there anything that you experienced or any suggestions for anyone in the audience who's, who's thinking, well, I don't know that my team is going to have the patience for that? Yeah, I think what was really helpful for me is that there was already a robust QI team in place, and they were already very used to these processes and how it goes. So I think what my suggestion would be for anybody who doesn't already have that process or that, that team in place is do just what I did when I joined the team and is, is go through those education things to learn about it. And so for the members of our, like for our PIS team, the patient access specialists, and kind of going back to one of the questions from before, they aren't really typically a core part of the QI team. Um, so for them, it was more just doing a lot of education with them on what our goals were and kind of what this process was going to look like. Thank you. Um, I'll add your sustainability right now looks very good, um, but patient access specialists often have a lot of turnover mm -hmm. um, and schedulers, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts are around how to maintain that sustainability going forward? So I think the key thing, because you're exactly right, our PAS is chronically understaffed and overwhelmed and chronically turning over. Um, so I think the biggest key in our sustainability has been our RNs in that continuous pushing and reminding the PAS and that they're really that key go between between me and when I come into the workroom and be like, I'm done seeing them. I want them to come back at this time. Then the RNs are really the ones helping to push the PAS. So it's a joint effort there. So you have a, a very nice comment, excellent presentation and use and review of QI tools. Um, two parts, can you comment on the time spent or burden to complete the documentation of your QI tools, which I know sometimes can be a challenge? Um, and then are you thinking of disseminating through publication? Um, so second question, yes. Uh, <laughs> just need to finish everything. As far as the documentation, documentation on the tools, it actually wasn't that burdensome because we did those forms together as a team during joint meetings. And so it was really just a couple minutes after the meetings that I just had to go back and clean them up. Yeah, I think we do. I think we'll, we have time for one more um, question. So you mentioned when you first joined the team, you spent dedicated time learning QI and focusing on how to frame your project work. I'm curious, um, just as we all are uh, strapped for time in our roles, um, how did you find time, make time, and also did you need advocacy from anyone on the team to really help you to be able to dedicate that to getting started? Um, again, it was a... a you know, kudos to Dr. Powers, um, a lot of him in helping me find those resources, advocating for me to get those resources. And then also my own division chief in my division is super supportive of these things. And I think also me being, 
you know, a young provider just straight out of fellowship, everybody was very much willing to invest in my education and support me so that I can be more effective. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next, um, our next talk is by Dr. James Toll. Um, he's an adult pulmonologist and the adult CF program director at Vanderbilt University. Thank you so much to um, the organizers and to the chairs for inviting us to come and present our um, data to you today. So I am I'm going to talk about improving. Uh, oh, sorry. Improving identification and evaluation of adult cystic fibrosis patients with advanced lung disease to increase timely referral for lung transplantation. Oops. going to test this real quick, make sure I have to do it. Okay. I have no disclosures to, um, to present uh, related to this presentation. Okay. So just by way of background, uh, since advanced lung disease is not something that everyone um, is familiar with in terms of uh, what we deal with sometimes in, in uh, the adult clinics, um, the CF Foundation um, guidelines for lung transplantation uh, were published in 2019, and they call for the systematic referral of patients based on primarily forced expiratory volume in the first second FEV1, as well as markers of shortened survival. And the figure on the right comes from those guidelines. And you can see the FEV1 is sort of the key metric being looked at there. But even in patients who have normal lung function, in that 50 to 100 percent predicted uh, range, it's recommended to at least discuss the concept of lung transplantation, that it may be a component of clinical care in the future for the patient. Um, when FEV1 drops below 50 percent of predicted, it's recommended to have an annual discussion um, that um, I specifically looks for barriers that may need to be overcome. Um, under 40% of predicted uh, is recommended to screen for markers of disease severity and refer if indicated. And, and that's um, one of the, the key changes that came about with these guidelines is starting to think about um, these things earlier. And then under 30% of predicted is referral for all patients. And um, the reason that's really important is that historically and sort of certainly in Training in CF um, historically was when the FV1 falls below 30% of predicted, you should refer the patient for transplantation. And that number um, had become somewhat exclusion of all others. That's the number that we looked at. And unless there was a really dramatic case of, of a patient decline, and we may not really think about it until they hit that threshold. And as you can see from this data that was published in 2017 and helped inform that, if you wait until someone falls below 30% of predicted, you may, have, you may be too late. And you can see here that patients, the proportion of patients who had outcomes of transplantation or death relative to when they crossed that threshold, it's in that first year or in that one to two year period where a lot of the highest portion of those patients were having those outcomes. So really, um, lung transplantation is a very methodical process by definition. Um, it's meant to identify barriers to go through all of these steps, not something that is meant to happen quickly. So by, by waiting until... Um, a patient falls below 30% of predicted, again, that, that may not be enough time to have the evaluation done. And um, in terms of um, sort of why our team sort of thought about this and why we thought about it now, is you know, these guidelines came out in 2019. And when they came out, we were very excited by it. Our lung transplant program had, had been conservative um, for many years and had was somewhat difficult to get patients transplanted at our center. We had to refer out some of our more complicated patients to other places. But we had a new transplant director, surgeon, who um, was really you know, revving our program up. We were very excited by this. And of course, you know, later in 2019, highly effective modulators became available for most patients. It's wonderful. So obviously a lot of patients who were in the process of uh, evaluation were taken off the wait list and, and no longer considered uh, candidates, which is great. Uh, COVID hit, and our you know, priorities obviously sort of shifted uh, gears towards COVID. And we realized coming out, coming into this year, that you know, we have a substantial portion of patients who, who do meet these criteria, who we really haven't been thinking about because they've been doing well and they're stable, but, but it's an opportunity that we, we knew we would um, be able to improve. So um, our QI team um, you know, started an initiative to identify CF patients with advanced lung disease, 
uh, perform the recommended evaluation, refer eligible patients in a timely manner. Our SMART aims were to increase the percentage of those patients who we did refer who were eligible and increase the percentage of the appropriate evaluation for markers of disease severity by 50%. Um, so our multidisciplinary QI team identified adult CF patients who met these criteria from January 2021 through September 2022, which is our most recent uh, update, by utilizing uh, port CF center-specific data, CF smart reports, and patient medical records. I should comment that port CF has a wonderful tool to identify advanced lung disease, and it, you know, it's, it definitely prompts us. Um, but that in and of itself is not really sufficient. It, it's not real-time, and a lot of patients who have been identified like as I mentioned, no longer really meet criteria for advanced lung disease. So you can't just use that tool. So we use smart reports and obviously we used um, analysis of the patient's medical records. And we identified them according to the 2019 guidelines. So we stratified them based on their FEV1s. And, and primarily we're looking at 40% and below. Um, the 50% uh, group that's eligible has some very specific criteria, but that did not apply to any of our patients. So when you, when you look at the guidelines, I, I sort of screenshotted the pertinent portion on the right of the slide. You can see it, there's quite a bit there. Um, and so these are specifically um, guidelines for patients whose FAV1 is less than 40% of predicted. Uh, and they, they meet criteria for having um, eating lung, or lung transplantation referral through these markers of shortened survival. So a six minute walk distance less than 400 meters, the presence of hypoxemia, hypercarbia, pulmonary hypertension, which is mainly defined by echocardiogram, but also um, BMI less than 18, um, greater than two exacerbations requiring IV antibiotics, or one um, exacerbation requiring positive pressure ventilation, massive hemoptysis, pneumothorax. So there's quite a bit there when you really look at it. It's not you know, just the numbers. But so we went through and analyzed all of these for our patients who um, met the FEV1 criteria. And our QI team um, got together to discuss this. We have regular QI meetings that we started several years ago when we um, participated in the CF um, Fun LLC3 in 2017. And we have continued going forward. We now have our meetings virtually since COVID, and I think that's probably a, a permanent change for now. Um, but you can see here a, a screenshot of our, our group who meets. Um, our QI team really represents all of the core clinical care team that sees patients in clinic. Uh, and has, we have patient family partners as well. So this is a tool I wanted to sort of go over and share. I, I do want to make note that uh, everything, this is de-identified. There's no patient names, obviously, but even the, the key information on the slide is, is made up and modified. So this is just a representative example. There's no patient identifiers uh, in there. But this is a tool that we use uh, as part of our pre-clinic planning. Um, our nurses sort of originate this. They talk to their care team members and we get input. And then we use it in our preclinic meeting um, that we have uh, after our QI meeting uh, before clinics for the week, and, um, and it can be modified further after that. But you can see here, I mean, we, we try to get most of the pertinent information in there, um, recent antibiotic use, what labs they might need, the, the codes there for the different care team members that we know need to see them, um, and then um, you know, events and other things that happen. We use a group uh, care model, so uh, we have three providers. We see all the patients. We don't have our own panels, so this helps improve communication, and especially if someone couldn't attend the preclinic visit or our preclinic meeting. Um, but we have a section there that we've added in um, patients' ALD status. So if they have ALD, we put it on, and we put on you know, what assessments they need. Um, and that allows us then in the, in the clinic room with the patient to sort of be prompted. You know, one of the things we, we felt over time is that um, especially with discussing so many other things, if a patient's doing well and is stable, you might recognize that they have an FEV1 that may put them into that, that category, but it may just not be a high priority for the visit, and you get to the end of the visit and, and you don't think about it. So that, this was sort of our, our impetus to that. This tool um, we did have at the QI event on Wednesday at our table. We have copies, or if, you, if anyone would like a copy or, or to see this, reach out to me and I can send it to you. So... Um, we um, evaluated um, whether or not patients um, had had appropriate um, tests done for markers of shortened survival and whether they had been referred. We used 2021 as our baseline and um, planned uh, to go through 2022 and beyond, but we have analyzed uh, quarterly uh, through September, and we did do some uh, statistics. We identified 35 patients. Um, five were no longer followed. Three had died, and two had moved or cared for at other centers. Um, like I said, we used 2021 as our baseline data. 
Um, four patients that we use for our baseline data, we did not carry forward into the intervention because they, by the end of 2021, it was clear that they had not met ALD criteria for the entire year, which is wonderful. Um, so there are 30 patients in our baseline group and 26 in our intervention group that we follow. This is our, our sort of main baseline versus intervention data. You can see that our, our eligible patients referred for lung transplant really have not changed, and we had referred about half, and it's, it's still the same. Um, our baseline um, performance of some of these metrics obviously is fairly low, uh, and I think reflects just what, you know, again, that we had somewhat lost sight of this as a, as a standardized um, process. But, you know, some patients had had an O2 assessment, an echocardiogram, and very few had had six-minute walks or blood gases. And uh, over the intervention, all of those markers have increased substantially, obviously, you know, significant for echocardiogram and six-minute walk. Um, and not for O2 assessment and blood gas, but we know these are small sample sizes and we don't necessarily expect statistical significance. Um, just looking at it over the quarter, we wanted to look at this just to see, you know, we rolled this intervention out uh, starting in January 2022, and we just wanted to see um, whether our effects were seen over the course of the year. And you can see that really, with the exception of the patients referred for lung transplant, that has not changed. But in terms of these assessments being performed, really across all quarters, there's been an increase. So I think it, it tells us that, you know, we are actually doing something. Um, you know, we, we designed it for quarterly assessment mainly because that we see patients mostly on a quarterly basis, and so it takes time. You see the patient, you order the test, the test gets done, usually the next time they come back to clinic if they are not coming back for some other reason. So um, we are seeing, you know, now at, you know, at the end of uh, quarter three, um, you know, we're hitting the 70 to 80 percent mark for um, ECHO and O2 assessment, and we're starting to climb in the others. Um, and this is just, again, um, should, you know, saying the same thing. So in terms of um, discussion, um, the development of the process to identify adult CF patients with advanced lung disease and closely follow the guidelines for lung transfer referral did lead to a significant increase in the evaluation of all of the assessments for shortened survival. Um, we feel like this was made in a pretty short period of time. We started seeing this uh, within three months, and over nine months we've seen you know, substantial increases. And we do think that over time the improved adherence to these guidelines will ultimately um, lead to appropriate referral for lung transplantation. You know, in terms of trying to think through our data, you know, part of why we think we have not seen any change yet is that it's still a very complicated discussion. And so some patients, um, you know, who, who meet the criteria, um, you know, may not be ready on the first time you talk to them to immediately go off and see the lung transplant clinic. It's pretty common if they're, if they're feeling pretty well to, to want to at least wait and talk about it and discuss it again. So um, I'm interested to see where this goes. But we suspect that as we do this, it will, it will rise quite a bit. And then just sort of, you know, sort of final thoughts um, for discussion. As, as I mentioned before, these guidelines came out in 2019. It was prior to uh, the widely available highly effective modulator therapies. And we all know that uh, the transplant landscape is changing, you know, in terms of the number of patients being referred and patients coming off the wait list. And you can see that, you know, in this data presented here. But they're really, you know, it, it, all the patients who were on the wait list before or who were being evaluated before, even if their FEV1 improves substantially, they're probably still at risk to, um, to progress over the future. And we've started to see that in some patients. And, um, you know, so I think as they're stable and doing well, they will still be at risk, you know, as, as if they progress. But the other thing is, you know, the, the data regarding these predictors of shortened survival and these metrics all also comes from the pre-modulator era. So it's interesting to think about, you know, patients whose FV1 falls below 30% of predicted, if that's a really, really, really slow process where they're very slowly progressing versus, you know, pre-highly effective modulator era where most, many of those patients were, were progressing quite, quite rapidly and crossing that threshold. It, it's interesting to, to see uh, where that goes. Um, but, uh, you know, highly effective modulator therapy has already, you know, very much affected the transplant referral process. So um, acknowledgements, acknowledge our CFQI team. I particularly point out the efforts of Susie Eastman, who's our CFLMQI leader and really keeps our team running. Um, all of our, our core um, clinical care team is part of the QI um, group. And then our patient family partner, who has been wonderful as well. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Toll. Um, I want to start off with a question. Um, what barriers did you identify related to completion of the ALD testing? So we all know that ordering it is only half of the challenge. Yes. Um, particularly, at least at our center, a lot of these tests aren't able to be done in the same location as our clinic. Right. Yeah, and so and some of them, the ones we can do in our clinic, um, our, our clinic is, is 
sort of attached to our PFT lab, and our PFT technicians will do six-minute walks. So we can order the six-minute walk um, with a PFT and have it kind of scheduled, bundled for the next time they come. We can add it on if we really need to. Um, the blood gases we've been doing in clinic when we draw labs, so that, that part we've been able to take care of. And the O2 assessment, you can obviously do as part of the six-minute walk. So that, that's made it easier. The echocardiogram is the big one. Um, and that we generally schedule for their next visit. We initially talked about sort of tracking orders, but we felt that, that would, we would order a lot of things and they wouldn't happen. So the biggest barriers have just been, um, you know, getting patients to agree to come and have multiple tests done. But fortunately, since we can do a lot of it in clinic, um, with the exception of the echoes, that hasn't been. The, the one, um, in terms of the way the guidelines are constructed, really it, it's an echocardiogram, it's not an annual thing. So if you sort of say, hey, we're gonna do this one time and if it looks good, you know, we'll, we'll not readdress this for a while, whereas the other tests are recommended to be done annually. Thank you. Um, a question kind of in follow-up with that, when you, so uh, this fantastic tool that has made such a difference in the identif identification, bringing it to light for your team to follow up on, um, has that had, uh, how has that impacted the conversations that you have in clinic and um, like you were saying, sometimes they fall to the end before you are identifying them. Just more thinking of the time spent and the discussions and the relationships. Have you noticed a difference with the way that patients and families are receiving that information or how it's being perceived, especially when you're talking about declining health or risk factors? Right. I think it really has helped. I mean, it mostly it helps bring it, bring it to our attention so that we know we're going we're gonna to discuss that and not kind of have it just slide through to the end. Um, in ter in, I think in terms of presenting it to patients, we say, you know, these are guidelines. The guidelines came out a number of years ago. Um, when it, 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 the issue being that many of these patients feel well and are doing well, um, and we say, so I know it's not something that you necessarily want to think about, but, you know, we really should be looking for these things because if, if you do have some of these markers, you should at least go meet the lung transplant team and have a discussion and kind of know about it so that you're on the radar. That's been probably the hardest part is just having that message get through to patients and not, you know, bring them down. I mean, we don't want to, many of them are, are doing quite well. Um, but I think that it's helped because we say this is part of our process. We're doing this for everyone. You know, your FEV1 is XYZ, and so that, that makes us want to look at these things. And, um, and it's been, I think it's been helpful. I think we've had pretty positive feedback from patients. Thank you. And, We, we have a good, so we, our clinics are together. We don't have them at the exact same time, but we all have clinics together, and our, our groups are um, uh, pretty closely tied together. We don't have any transplant pulmonologists on our, our care team, but um, so, so far what we've done is we generally get direct feedback from them, usually in the form of a message uh, or a discussion, and then we add that to our sort of templates for them that they saw Dr. So-and-so on this date, and, and many of them are in the process where it's sort of um, come back in six months, you know, we'll just reassess you. Because most of them, when they meet the transplant team, the transplant team does not feel they're in their window. Um, and most of them have not actually started the, the true transplant evaluation process. Um, but we have some who definitely have. And, and so in, ter in terms of tracking, it's mostly just through person-to-person -person discussion and then um, inclusion in our notes that we then carry forward. I wanted to also ask who on your team was responsible for identifying the ALD patients or was it a joint effort between multiple people? We did a joint effort in that initial analysis since there's so much stuff, we, we broke that apart and did that and uh, created the, li um, the list of ALD patients. Okay. The, the tool um, is, is a, also a joint effort. Our nurses um, really are the ones who spearhead that. They, they have most of that information put together before we get together. They, they seek, the in terms of um, the other care members need to see them. That, that's, that's provided by the other care team members. But our nurses sort of spearhead that, and then we discuss it as a group. Great. Thank you so much. We felt like this talk was really important to include, you know, in the CFDR modulator era to make sure we keep our eyes on these advanced lung disease patients as well. So thank you. Thank you.
All right, so we have gone through so many different aspects of the lifespan of a person with CF and their families and quality improvement, such excellent presentations. Um, and so we are gonna do our final presentation this morning. Um, Rhonda West is a senior analyst for the Center for Public Health Innovation, or CPHI, at CI International. And she is gonna be talking to us today about um, her excellent quality improvement work with newborn screening. And I am excited to welcome her to the podium. Thank you all so much for choosing to be here today. Um, my name is Rhonda West, and I will be discussing the development of state-level reports for the evaluation of CF newborn screening. Could you pull that microphone down just a little bit? Oh, yes. yes. I was told that I had to hit the touchpad. I'm sorry. <laughs> Am I doing it wrong? Thank you. Off to a very smooth start. So, <laughs> Is that opposite of what I told you? <laughs> That's all right. Um, there are no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. The work I'll be discussing today is part of the larger Cystic Fibrosis 10-Year Evaluation Project, which is led by Susanna McCauley and funded by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Newborn screening for CF was implemented in all 50 states and D.C. by 2010. And since then, evidence has shown that when you look at the population in aggregate, babies with CF are overall in America being treated earlier. However, variations in processes exist across states. So newborn screening systems from state to state are not the same. They're the same at the high level but the specific processes involved um, can differ and can have an impact on the age of CF diagnosis and intervention. And in fact, as an example, you can see this variation when you compare the median age of diagnosis across states. What's happening, so this graph right here gives you all 50 states and DC in an anonymized fashion. Um, What's happening differently between the low bars and the high bars? Without knowing the state-specific newborn screening system, it's really impossible to tell. So in order for a state to be able to identify quality improvement opportunities in their CF newborn screening system, <clears throat> they need to be able to see and evaluate their newborn screening and diagnostic processes at every step. And the presentation, sorry, the project that I'll be discussing today aims to meet this need by developing individualized state reports to inform quality improvement initiatives. This presentation will be about a process of bringing together newborn screening data and follow-up data for the first time. Not only has this not been done for CF before, but it hasn't been done in this way for any of the newborn screening disorders. And what I think you'll find is that the process that I'll be describing in itself is a CQI, Continuous Quality Improvement Project, within a Continuous Quality Improvement Project, or as I like to call it, conception. <laughs> I'm only going to say that once, I promise. <laughs> so more specifically, the objectives of the report are to, one, provide state newborn screening and CF centers with data to understand their, their system in the 10 years following universal implementation. We want these reports to inform data-driven quality improvement efforts, but we don't want to stop there. We also actually want to engage personnel from both the state newborn screening programs and the CF centers within the states and assist them in their QI initiatives. And lastly, we want to continue to deliver these reports with updated data and content. We don't want this to be just a one-time thing. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, I've divided our methods into five steps, acquire, explore, design, share, and act. And I'll go through each one of these with you. So the first step, 
we had to acquire the newborn screening data and the follow-up data. From the newborn screening side, we reached out to New Steps, which is the Newborn Screening Technical Assistance and Evaluation Program, a program under the Association of Public Health Laboratories, or APHL. And we requested aggregate QI data and individual case data for each state. So how it works is that newborn screening programs um, enter their data into the New Steps data repository. And for us to be able to pull that data out, we needed to get permission from the states. <clears throat> so we reached out to all states, and 32 of them gave us that permission. On the follow-up side, we used the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's patient registry, which, as you may know, is a consent-based registry estimated to hold about 84% um, data for about 84% of the CF population. And this was for all states. Next we needed to explore the data. Every data analysis project has this step in it, the exploratory analysis. Um, this is where I personally stepped in to the project, and I explored these data from several different angles. I looked at distributions, demographics, missing data, every which way. And I summarized my findings and presented them to my project team and we worked together to determine the metrics that we wanted to use it for the first draft of the reports. We wanted to give states and CF centers a draft to react to, and then based on their feedback, improve before we released the, I'll call it the official first version of the report. Once the metrics were decided upon, I used our studio to develop the reports. Our studio is really, I am, such an R fanatic because one of the things that you can do on there is actually design a template in Word and feed it into R. And R will take all of the graphs and tables that you've created in the program and apply it to the template in a way that is automated and repeatable. So literally with the push of a button and maybe 10 minutes time of just waiting and sitting there really, um, I can generate a report for every single one of the um, states and DC. So once the first draft was generated, and this is what it looked like, no, you don't really have to pay close attention to what's included, just to give you an idea of, it was about eight pages long, um, <clears throat> and really just mainly full of visualizations, not a lot of text. We reached out to the states and requested their feedback. And of the 32 state participants, we had seven, 27, excuse me, states, and that's newborn screening programs or CF centers, agree to either sit on a feedback session. We had four one hour long feedback sessions or provide written feedback. This is an outstanding response rate to a feedback request. Um, one person even wrote a 1500 word response. Um, it, was, it was awesome. And we had so much great feedback that we knew we weren't going to be able to execute everything for the first version of the report. So we needed a way to prioritize all of the suggestions that had been made. I could probably do an entire presentation about this feedback analysis, but what's really important to know is that we scored every single one of the recommendations for popularity, how many states how many um, participants were interested in it, feasibility of the change, and quality of the data that it would involve. And here's just a glimpse of the spreadsheet that we used for this analysis. The sum of those three scores helped us determine what to include in the current version of the reports. So once we analyzed the feedback, it was back to development for me. And many, many hours later, we had doubled the content of the report. So just going back a little bit, so you can see this is version one, or I'll say the draft, and then this is what it looks like now. Um, at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to scan a QR code to view a sample of the report. So hint, hint, if you need to get your phones out. 
The current version includes five sections. Summary statistics, demographics, timeliness, diagnostic testing, and growth metrics. It has 12 graphs and four tables, and it comes with a supplemental uh, document that is essentially a glossary of terms. It tells you all of the different data sources that we used and the exact fields and what they mean. That one's about a three-page document. So in other words, from what you can see here, you can kind of glean the type of feedback we got. It was what I will refer to as yes and feedback. We like what you've done here so far, but we still want to see all of these different things, and we want to see explanations, not just visualizations, but also more, more words. And because the report in its current state is much more extensive, I won't have time to present every single visualization that we include, so I just wanted to highlight just three. The first one is the median timeline of a cystic fibrosis diagnosis. This one happens to be my favorite. Um, what you're seeing here, the bold numbers are the median age at diagnosis. And the shaded bars are the intervals. So of those, for example, 33 days, oops, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Got too excited. One day was, for specimen collection, one day had passed before specimen uh, collection. One day had passed before the sample was received at the lab. Um, six days before the results were released. And 33 days before the diagnosis was confirmed. And I'm going to use Shinan's um, just for funsies disclaimer on here as well. This is not real. <laughs> This also includes a comparison between the state and the U.S. as a whole. This was very highly in demand um, when we did our feedback sessions. People seemed really interested in wanting to do this comparison. The next highlight is the age at first CF event graph. If you're not familiar with this term, the age of first CF event is a composite measure that is calculated using the first clinic visit, sweat test, or care episode. Whichever one of those things happens first, that's your age at first CF event. And here, we actually compare an individual state with one screen states and two screen states. So in other words, states that only require one blood spot to be screened, and states that require a minimum of two. Another piece of feedback we received is this sort of division, one screen state versus two screen states. How do they, how do they differ? And the last highlight is the growth metrics section. Um, we divided the patients into three cohorts and show height for age and weight for age at fir the first, fifth, and tenth year of life. And this gives the states an ability to track trends in growth outcomes. So right now we are in the process of securely delivering these reports to the newborn screening programs, who are then responsible for sharing them with the CF centers. Per the memorandum of understanding between newborn screening programs and APHL, they are essentially the gatekeepers to their new steps data. We, as the project team, cannot share their data, only they can share their data. So we send it to the newborn screening programs, and we are planning to notify the CF centers when we've sent it to the newborn screening programs, but really they'll have to reach out to the newborn screening program or maybe the contacts that the newborn screening programs will forward it on um, in order for the CF centers to get a hold of these reports. So the last stage is the ACT stage, and I have listed this as current and next steps because as we're delivering these reports, we're also trying to engage with the states before each one of these reports is sent out, 
not only does it get a thorough QC check, but we're also looking through it to try to glean insights that we might be able to communicate to the recipients as we're delivering them. For example, one of the states that we reached out to, we noticed that the median age of diagnosis that was reported in the newborn screening data and the median age of diagnosis that was reported in the CFF patient registry were completely different. One was maybe 18 days and the other was, I mean, closer to 50. So is there a problem or isn't there? And that is really indicative of all of, not all, but a lot of the QI opportunities that I've seen so far have been related to data collection. Are we using the same definitions um, between the newborn screening side and the uh, uh, CF center side? Are we entering the data? Another state that we reached out to, um, they actually responded and said, hey, wait, something's wrong. We're missing any of our age at diagnosis graphs. Um, when there's no data available, it'll say, it'll show this just the shell and say no data available. And I reached out and said, no, actually there's, there's no data in there. And they had thought that for years this field was being entered into their New Steps repository and it hadn't been. So that presented a really great opportunity for training um, for the people who were responsible for entering the data. And like I said, we'd like to then assist states with their QI initiatives <clears throat> after uh, we've talked to them about what they've gained from these reports. And number three, I'd really love to continue to enhance and deliver these reports, ideally on an annual basis. Um, our feedback spreadsheet is going to be kept and used and added to um, to determine what we would like to see next in future versions of the report. A few challenges. Um, the first one is missing data. This is kind of a common challenge. The project that we're doing, the analysis is observational, it's retrospective. The people entering the data in the first place weren't anticipating that we'd be using it for this purpose. However, we've made it easy for anybody to update their data send it to us, and with the push of a button, we can regenerate the report, an updated report for them. The next challenge is contact management. Um, because the newborn screening programs are the gatekeepers of the data, we really have to make sure that our contact list is kept up to date, um, and that can be a challenge. And the third thing I wanted to mention is the inability to link. The newborn screening uh, new steps repository data and the CFF patient registry data, both of those are de-identified. And they don't include a shared unique ID. So ideally, we would be able to track one patient from one data set to another, but we're unable to do that. So I'm going to pause and let you guys take a picture. This uh, QR code will also be on the next couple of slides. And I want to thank my amazing project team um, for all their help and work on this initiative. And at this time, I will take questions. Thank you so much, Rhonda. So we really were so excited to include this project. And we've heard a lot at conference already about health disparities in early diagnosis as well as state-to-state -state disparities, like when your diagnosis shouldn't be based on what state you live in. Um, and I think as we were reviewing your project, it just really helped remind us of the annual reports that we get every year from the CF Foundation that were referred to in several of the other talks, um, and how that's just been such an impetus to teams to develop QI projects. And so, you know, I think we're all hoping that these types of reports to the states will be an impetus to develop those QI projects. We wanted to get your feedback on how do you anticipate states learning from other top performing states? Do you have ideas about a venue or mechanism for this? So this is something that's still in talks. Um, while we're reaching out to states, we're trying to see who, who has similar issues, who has opposing issues, like which state is really great in one area and which state 
could use some help. And then what we plan to do is instead of working with the states one-on-one, -on -one, we'd actually like to take a collaborative learning model and as much as possible bring states together um, in the same room and work on a common initiative in that way. I think this, this may have been answered with what you just mentioned, but do you foresee any state testing standards changing based on the results from the report showing state comparisons and diagnosis timelines? Possibly. I think especially in the one to two screen state or one, the comparison between the one and two screen states, it's very easy to see that the two screen states take a bit longer um, for um, patient diagnosis. I don't know how much work is involved in that process, but I could, I could see it making a difference. Definitely. Um, Dita Ong had a question. Will the reports be distributed to all states or can centers request the reports? Yes, so the reports will be distributed to all states, even the ones that did not um, agree to provide us with their newborn screening data. Um, we can send them the reports. The newborn screening aspects, like I said before, um, there will just be empty table shells that say no data available. Um, the CF centers um, can, in that case, uh, reach out directly to us to get those, but we still would want to also have the newborn screening programs see them because I would really love it if everybody could participate in this and share their um, newborn screening data to give that complete picture. Uh, this one was a, a curiosity question. I don't know if you can answer this one. Um, do you know why the other 18 states, or 19 um, with DC, 20 with Puerto Rico, give permission to use their data, or was it a non-response? I actually am not sure of that. Um, I could find out if the person who asked that wants to reach out. I can... I can um, try to look that information up. Um, I wasn't involved so much in that area of the project, but I'm also curious. And how do you think your team will encourage the states to engage with the care centers, especially in states where there are a lot of different care centers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I should also mentioned that part of this larger project, the CF 10-year evaluation project, has included different studies, one of which was a um, qualitative study where 30 states were reached out to and interviewed. Both newborn screening programs uh, personnel were interviewed and CS Center personnel were interviewed. And we're taking a lot of what we learned from that study to inform our next steps because the number one, the primary barrier to, t to timely diagnosis that was identified through just interviews was a lack of communication um, between the newborn screening side and the CF center side. So we're trying to bring this data-backed, you know, proof of um, an issue in communication to encourage states to engage with their CF centers. And we are um, happy to facilitate those, those sessions. Um, and I think uh, right before we wrap up, um, we have one final question. Are you able to share uh, the top 10 states diagnosing patients with CF sooner, or is there a way that uh, these teams can access that data so that we can learn from one another? Or is that still in the future? Oh, that's a good question. I think I would have to double check about that. Um, I know there are some very strict rules around um, sharing these data. The CF Center data could be shared, yeah. And I guess just a final question. This is such a fantastic representation of how we use data to identify problems, right? So I think we can all think of those patients and families who are at the, the far end of those days of diagnosis and uh, the disparities that that can create into just getting first care, best care right away. Um, when 
this group of people and others we share this information with are interested in learning from others and wanting to potentially connect with your group, what is the best way to do that? And is there something that we can uh, you know, talk with you about as far as next steps? Ooh, I think we would love getting as much engagement as possible. Um, if you would like to join our conversations, um, you can reach out to me personally and I will see that that happens. Um, we are really actually hoping for that sort of engagement to occur. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. That concludes our session. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our speakers um, for these wonderful talks. And we hope you all leave invigorated to begin new QI efforts. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>